Proverbs chapter number 1. I'm going to read two verses this morning, beginning in verse number 22. The Bible says, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity, and the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge? Turn you at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, I will make known my words unto you. Now, in chapter number 1 of the book of Proverbs, Solomon starts off the chapter in verse number 1 for a couple of verses explaining why he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Then he turns in verse number 20, and he starts using a metaphor that wisdom being a lady that's crying from the city walls to all that will hear. Verse number 22 and verse number 23 are part of what Solomon says wisdom cries. Okay, she's begging people to come and receive wisdom. Okay, now first let's stop. We can go all the way back to verse number 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Solomon starts off giving proper perspective and saying man's wisdom's not what we're searching for. We're searching for the wisdom of God. And he says, and God's wisdom cries on the walls of the city. That means everybody that comes in and everybody that goes out, she's begging them. Saying, seek the understanding of the Lord. Right? Wisdom's here to take. All you got to do is ask for it. Okay, in fact, the Bible elsewhere says that if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of the Lord, gives all, unto all men liberally. You know what that means? Press down, shaking, and bubbling over. Right? So much that you can't contain it. Just like God does with blessings and just as God does with instruction and just as God does with it's everything. What does God reward? He rewards faithfulness and He rewards those that do what Jesus said and preached in His earthly ministry. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Right? Ask, you shall receive. Right? Those that through faith believe that God has what it is that they need, God gives them a whole helping full of it. How much so? Well, so much that the psalmist said, daily he loadeth us with benefits. Right? He doesn't sprinkle them. He doesn't give out portions to everybody. No, he loads everybody's wagon up. Well, that's what wisdom's saying here in verse number 22. It says, how long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? Okay, so now we've got to play the teenager's favorite game during teen class, the definition game only you guys get to escape the fear of me just sitting there and waiting for y'all to come up with an, a, a definition for the word simple and then I tell you if it's right or wrong okay you don't have to play that part of it simple does not mean stupid okay S simple does not mean ignorant meaning that you've never heard that before okay simple does not mean as some people nowadays, because they don't like people using certain words, they'll refer to people with certain disabilities as simple. That's not what this word simple means. Okay, when it says simple and simplicity, the root definition of that word is alone. Right? Uncomplex. Right? But the definition that really hits the nail home is nothing added to it. A simple thing is simple because it's by itself. It doesn't have anything to go along with it. Okay, let me give you an example. There's a real simple version of a salad. It's called you go out and you cut the grass in the backyard and eat it. That's simple. It's just grass. Okay, you can do the same thing with lettuce or romaine, but iceberg, whatever you want to use. Technically, a salad is a salad if you just have lettuce. But that's not a good salad. Okay, especially if you're like Brother Jordan and you're not much on the, uh, the vegan or the vegetarian train, okay? It's not a real salad until you've at least got meat in it, okay? The leaves should be weighed down by all the meat on top of it. That is a salad, okay? At that point, you might as well just wrap it in a tortilla and call it a burrito, okay? But a salad is not just lettuce. Lettuce alone, right, it's simple. So what do they do? Well, if you're smart, you put this thing called dressing on it, which if you're trying to eat healthy, that kills it right there because dressing's got more calories in it than most of the food you used to eat, right? 
but you want something that adds flavor. Right? There's seasonings that you can put on salad. Some people even bake up bread that has a whole bunch of seasoning on it called croutons. Okay? Back in the day, they used to put anchovies on it. <laughs> right? But they would add it to what? To make it complex. Okay, things added to it. Now here, Solomon is saying, if you are a follower of the Lord and you remain simple, you have nothing added to it. He's not just saying that it's a problem. He's saying that God has commanded us not to be simple. Okay, well, let's, ex let's explore this for a second, and then we'll get back to the verses. We know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that salvation was given to us by grace through faith. Okay, we've looked at it many times in this class. Okay, that God gave unto every man a measure of faith. Because God knew that you didn't have enough in yourself to believe on God on your own, so he gave you the faith to let you exercise it. You still had to choose to use it, but God even took away the restriction of you having to go find your own faith. He said, no, I'll give you faith with the hope that we would choose to exercise that faith in believing on Jesus Christ. Right? So the bare minimum that it takes for you to get saved, God already took care of. He gave you the faith. God took away all the obstacles. All you had was a choice. Okay? But see, simple belief in God stops at faith. Faith with nothing added to it is a miserable Christian life. If faith was all that you needed, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 be the only part of the New Testament after the earthly ministry of Christ. Everything from the book of Acts forward would be about how Christ only wanted you to have faith in Him. Well, if you go to a lot of churches nowadays, that's all you're going to hear. It's preaching and teaching about faith. Now see, when I say simple, God's not telling you to go out and go get a PhD and everything before you can feel like you've got a master on it. No, the Bible is very simple to understand. It is easy to understand. Okay, but simple does not mean God doesn't want his book to be understood by all. Okay, in fact, they studied it out. It's written on about an eighth grade reading level. It is not hard to understand, but that does not mean that it is not complex, meaning that there are a lot of things that God expects from those that follow him, from those that worship him, from those that serve him. If faith was all that it took to be a pastor, the portion out of the epistles that were written to Timothy about the qualifications of a bishop wouldn't be in the Bible. Okay, or the qualifications of a deacon. Right, or what God expects from church members. No, if faith was all that you needed, that's all that would be talked about. Okay, but you are a simple Christian if what you're toting around is that all you've got is faith in God. Well, faith is a good thing, because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. But it didn't say that faith was all that it took to please Him. Okay, give you another one. There's a lot of people that they've got faith, but then they get and they find out about grace, and they want to live in grace. Well, we live in the dispensation of grace. We talked about that when we were in the book of Revelation. And grace is a wonderful thing. You know what that means? That's all the good stuff we get because Christ took our punishment on the cross. Grace is things that we should have had no claim to, but God gives them to us anyway. And there's so many people walking around preaching and teaching that grace is all that you need. Not according to the Bible. That's a simple way of thinking. That if there was just one answer, the Bible would be a whole lot shorter. Do you really believe that an all-knowing, all-powerful God would have wasted words on the page over the course of about 4,000 years because he wrote things down that you didn't need. That the word that he promised to preserve until he destroyed the earth. Okay, in fact, it's going to be preserved in heaven forevermore. We know that. 
The most eternal thing that you can get on this world on this world is a copy of the Word of God. But if he promised to preserve it, don't you think that he thought each one of those words is worth preserving? But let's get back to verse number 22. He says, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? Okay, simple things are, you know, if you find something new in the Bible, God illuminates it to you. It's real easy to get real excited because you know what that is? That's the Holy Ghost revealing to you what God Himself wants you to know and understand about God. That is a marvelous and miraculous thing that we, born in sin, cursed with sin, sinners by practice, sinners by trade, had no claim to God, that God sent His Son, but then also sent the Spirit to illuminate the Word of God so that you yourself could know what a thrice holy God in heaven wanted you to understand from the Word of God. You ought to get excited about it. But see, I don't know about you, but when I get into the Word of God, I get excited about it. I want to go tell people, hey, guess what I saw today? Right? I never put these pieces together before. But it's not too long, and I'm wondering where the next puzzle piece is. There's a hunger for more. Jesus does save and satisfy, as our friend Brother Sidney Weaver says. But that satisfaction is not a lump sum payment. You are continually satisfied by God the more that you return to the things of God. It will satisfy you until when? You need another meal. I ate this morning. I can promise you, I'm eating after church. You say, are you satisfied right now? Probably. I'm focused on teaching. I can't really answer that question right now. I'm not really thinking about my stomach. But I can promise you before the day's over, I'm eating again. I'll even go as far to say I'm eating at least twice before the day's over if the Lord don't come back. That may be more. I don't know. But you see, a love of simple things inhibits you. It cripples you as a Christian. If all you want to focus on is one puzzle piece, you're missing a whole lot of what God intends you to have. Well, it says, how long will ye love simplicity? You know why he refers to them in the first part of that verse as simple ones? Because that's what they love. Whatever you love, it does make an impact on you. If you love the, as the Bible talks about, those deep things, those mysteries of the, words of, the Word of God, if you've got a hunger for them, you know what you're going to find? Those things. God will reveal them to you. The person that knows the most about the Word of God is not the person who has the most degrees on saying that they know about the Bible. It's the person that spends the most time in fellowship with God while studying the Word of God. You say, well, they didn't do this or they didn't do that. They know more about it because they've lived it. They've hungered for it and God responded by satisfying that hunger. True hunger, you know why you get hungry? You get hungry because your body needs more energy to go out and do things. A true love of the Word of God is not so that you can tout how much you know over somebody else's head. You hunger to hear from the Word of God because you want to go out and live it. You need something to go out there that fuels right, your car. That's why you have to keep going back to the gas station because the car needs more gas. If all you're holding on to is a gallon of gas, it's not going to get you very far. And if all that your tank can hold is a gallon, you're going to have to go back and refresh on them simple things a lot. You can go a whole lot further, and you can save a whole lot of time, if what? If you embrace the whole counsel of the Word of God. Isn't that what Paul told preachers to preach? Isn't that what we're required to be found accountable before God of? Remember a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about those judgment seats? And then way back in the beginning of Revelation when we talked about the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to have to give an account of every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. 
You don't just have to give an account of the parts that you knew the best. No, you've got to give an account of all of it. Because that's how much God cares about. All of it. But then, he says, not a, how long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. That's two more questions. He's saying, how long are scorners going to delight in their scorning? Well, if you're a golfer, you like playing golf. Okay? If you're a worker, I hope that you enjoy working. Otherwise, you're not going to get a good paycheck. Okay? You can ask any preacher. Preachers enjoy preaching. Okay? Missionaries love going out and being used of God to witness to others. Right? It's their identity because it's what they do. People gave them the title... Right for what God put inside of them. People identify you with the title because of what you do. You know how long scorners are going to like scorning? As long as they're scorners. Because it's what they do. Well, what causes a scorner? Well, scorners usually are bitter. Okay, There's, The Bible says a whole lot about the root of bitterness. Okay, I like Brother Sammy's take on it. Bitterness is a poison that you feed yourself trying to kill your enemies. The only person that it's doing is damaging you. Okay, a lot of them are hurt. If you've been hurt by somebody, you're going to be a little leery of the next person that comes along claiming to be of the same stripe and the same tribe. Okay, some people have been damaged either by others or themselves. Right? They can't get over what has happened to them and that keeps them from making any progress in the future. They think, you know, that's, it's just going to come to nothing. I did my best, and it turned out the worst way possible. Right? How is it, their life's going to be the same. The world's unfair. It's an evil place. They're not necessarily wrong about all those things. But it's not that the world is the way that it was that caused that to happen. They can't separate between the two. There's a whole lot of reasons that people will scorn and people will mock and make fun of. But then the last question is, how long will fools hate knowledge? You know why they call them fools? Because they're foolish. What is folly? Folly's doing something knowing that it's not the best thing to do. Okay, it is foolish for somebody that has consumed alcohol to get behind the wheel of a car. Okay, it didn't say that it's illegal, although at a certain point it does become illegal in man's eyes. I'm saying it's foolish, it's unadvisable, it's not a good thing to do. You remember used to when the sign said, don't drink and drive? Now it says, drink and drive responsibly. They're okay with you having a little, just not a whole lot. Used to, it was just, don't do it. Bad. What happened? They rebranded because they offended some people. But how long are fools going to hate knowledge? As long as they love foolishness. As long as they want to be able to embrace their own foolishness and live without other people having an influence on what is quote-unquote right and wrong. You know what I see? I don't watch the news anymore, but you know what I hear when people tell me what they saw on the news? I hear a whole lot of foolishness. It's people wanting to do what they want to do and then dictate what the outcome is. No, you don't get to do that. You reap what you sow. You have a choice on what you sow. You don't have a choice on what comes up out of the ground. You've got to deal with what you planted. Well, how long? Why that question? How long? Because it doesn't have to be that way. You know what stops foolishness? We've already heard it. Knowledge. You know what counters scorners? Sincerity. You know what counters simplicity? The counter to simplicity is devotion. You know why people love simplicity? Because it doesn't require much effort. Simple things... You can pick that up and put it back down. You've got a handle on that. 
You've got a handle on faith. Oh, that just means trust God. Well, at its barest form, yes, that's what the word faith means. But that is not a definition of what it means to live by faith. What about worshiping by faith? What about praying by faith? You don't find those things on a short little definition that you can put on an index card and say, hey, tell me what this is. Faith has a whole lot of layers to it. Each one of those layers are easy to understand, but it takes a whole lot of devotion to put them into practice. Grace is real easy to wrap your head around. Why? Because that means that God gives it to us. You know what isn't? So simple, living in the perfect will of God. We've got a handbook that tells us exactly how to do it. But understanding it, putting it into practice, that requires devotion. What about servitude? Uh, people don't like that. That requires a lot of devotion. What about faithfulness? Uh, people don't like that. I don't have to be at church in order to worship God. That's true, but you do have to be at church in order to fellowship with other believers. And the Bible has a whole lot to say about how important other believers are to other believers. How He fitly framed us together. How He made us the body of Christ. But see, those things aren't simple. I, I, don't, want, I don't want part two of the lesson. Do you know what you're saying? You don't care what God has to say about it. You've redefined the goalpost of spirituality in your life. And you think that simple things are going to get you across the finish line. Well, verse number 23. Turn you at my reproof. Okay? Fun fact. Reproof and rebuke are not the same thing. That's why God used two different words for them. Rebuke is when you are outwardly called out as being wrong. Okay? Reproof is instruction that is meant to get you to understand you need to change. Let me give you an example. If a teacher hands you back a test, right? Anybody ever get one of these? Right? Where you get the grade, but then underneath it's got comments all over the place about what you did wrong. That's not meant for anybody else to see except you. That's reproof. That's instruction. That's showing you where you went wrong so that you don't go wrong again. But if that teacher stood up and said, I've got so-and-so's test in my hand, and here's all the things that they did wrong, that's rebuke. That's you've continued to go down the wrong path, and now it needs to be addressed and confronted. Right? Mistakes are things that you did not mean to do. Those can be addressed with reproof. Rebuke is required to address things that you knew were wrong to do, but you did it anyway. It was brought to your attention by God, and you didn't heed His warning. So when it says, turn at my reproof, what Solomon's really saying is, right now's the point in time where you've got a space to change your direction before you have to face consequences or where the consequences seem to be manageable. Right? You can have a handle on dealing with the seed that was planted because you didn't put a lot of effort. It was a mistake. You didn't mean to do it. But by implication, what he's saying is if you keep sowing, he's got a whole book behind this first chapter of showing you what comes about from foolishness and folly and rebuke and scorners and all of these things that he's already warned us about. He says, if you stay simple, you're going to have to pay the price. There's coming a day where God's going to send rebuke. He says, don't let it get to rebuke. Embrace the reproof. That word reproof literally means to reprove to someone or to convince them again. To give them evidence to support what they already knew or may have forgotten. It's not an indictment. It's not God bringing out the, chas uh, the chastening rod. It's God with open arms of love saying, come back to this. This is the way that it should have been. 
don't continue. It's okay. We can get, you know, thankfully, 1 John 1, 9, if we're faithful to confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. He's saying, get it made right now so that we have more time to do good. Rebuke comes when you've run out of time and it needs to be addressed now. He says, turn at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Again, remember what I said before? That God, when it came to salvation, removed all the obstacles and all that was left to us was a choice? Well, here, wisdom is saying, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. You know what God says when it comes to understanding the things of God? He's saying, I'll do all the work. Just come and receive it. He says, I'll pour out the knowledge. He preserved it. He promised that the Spirit would be uh, our witness to lead and guide us into all truth. That the Spirit would be our teacher when it comes to spiritual things and the Word of God. That we wouldn't have to decipher and go to somebody that supposedly knew a whole lot and went into a back room and then, you know, threw some things against the wall and then come out and said, I prayed really hard. And this is what God wants you to do. No, God says, I'll tell you. I'll pour it out unto you. I'll give you everything that I've got if you're interested and you want to receive it. Then it's not just giving it to you. doesn't do you a whole lot of good to get something that you don't know how to use. He says, I will make known my words unto you. If you know the words of something, you know what that means? You understand it. God didn't just pour out things that are beyond our capability of understanding. No, he says, I'll pour out my knowledge, my wisdom unto you, and I'll make it known unto you. It's one of the beauties of the Holy Spirit. One of my responsibilities at my job is training other people. You know how hard it is to train other people that don't think like you? You know how many people in this world think like me? I've learned none. People learn different things. People understand in different ways. God made you. God knows how you think. God knows your understanding. And He's promising to break down all of His wisdom to where you can know it, understand it completely as God would want you to understand it. Because here's the limitation on teaching. Here's the limitation on preaching. Here's the limitation on anything that comes to the Word of God. If it was all man's doing, you would be hindered by how much this person knew, or the pastor knew, or the person that's teaching you knew. You would be hindered by how well they understood it. Well, here, Solomon, using a metaphor, says... The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. If you want wisdom, first you've got to start with Him. You've got to have a reverence for God, His order, His laws. Right? You have to understand that God's in control. Then God can give you wisdom. And He's saying God's wisdom's crying out, begging people to come and take it. That she'll pour it out on them. That she'll break it down and make it easy to understand but you're not going to be able to stay simple. Just because it's simple to understand does not mean that the idea is simple. You know what Christianity is? Christianity is a whole bunch of Legos. One Lego block doesn't do you too much good. People come by, they say a Lego block, they don't want what you got. But you take a whole bunch of different ones in different shapes and different sizes, you let God start arranging them and meeting those things together, adding them together, they're not simple anymore. Now they're complex. Not because they're hard to understand. A Lego brick's really easy to look at and figure out, oh, that's not that complex of a design. Right? That's the beauty of Lego. You can take these uncomplicated things and make them into a complicated thing. It doesn't mean that it's hard to understand how to use Legos. But the bucket that I had as a kid, there was all either squares or rectangles. 
and the rest of it was your imagination. Just like the old Lincoln log sets, right? Or the erector set kits, right? They were all, the erector set, they was just punched out metal. Wasn't no complex design to it. But yet you could make a whole lot of things that were very detailed out of it. If you zoom in close enough on any masterpiece of artwork, if you really zoom in, it's a whole bunch of simple brush strokes that make up that very detailed thing. You know what God's saying? He wants detailed Christians. God wants Christians that aren't just a single brush stroke on a canvas. Although nowadays they'll tell you that that's modern art and it's worth $50 billion. Hogwash. It's one thing of paint on a canvas. That, that's not art. Because art is detailed. Art is taking something that anybody could do, but doing something that is impressive with it. Those are the people that get recognition. You know why? Because they are not simple. They've honed their craft. They've mastered it. They've learned how to take simple techniques, but do things that people can't wrap their head around with it. You know what our job as Christians is to be? Be something that this world can't figure out. To have all of those uncomplicated things put together where they say, I want inside of me what's inside of them. That's not done with simple things. Right? All the kids at the birthday party, if you've only got one Lego brick, nobody wants to play with you. Right? That's boring. That's simple. I understand that. You bust out a PlayStation 3 where you can shoot people all the time. They're like, yeah, wow, that looks cool. But simple things are not engaging. Simple Christians are not engaging. I dare say that because of the instruction that we receive from the Word of God, that remaining a simple Christian is sinful. Because we are commanded to grow in the Lord. A seed is a simple thing, but a tree is not. It started off as something simple, but it grew into something more complex. You know what our responsibilities as Christians is? To bear much fruit. Well, actually, we're to bear fruit. It's up to God how much fruit we bear, but we're to be fruitful. How's that start? With well, something simple. You know the simplest that your Christianity should ever have been? should have been when you chose to put your faith in the Lord because that was a decision that had one or two answers. Right? That was simple. But then as God gives you simple truths out of the Word of God, what are you supposed to do to them? Add them to your arsenal. If simple was the answer, the whole armor of God would have had one piece to it. If simple was the answer, there wouldn't have been Ten Commandments or four hundred, you know, some 600 laws in the Old Testament. There would have been one. Now, if we go and we break down all of those things, it's pretty simple to get what the point is. But to do all of those things together, you know what they are? They're showing a pattern of good works to the world. Why do you do the things that you do? Well, it's not because of all of these little individual simple pieces you got. It's what's on the inside of the simple pieces. It's what God's done for me. But man, I'd love to live your life. Hey, I appreciate the compliment, but it's not because of anything that I've done. It's because of what God's done in me. Just as salvation is not by works of righteousness, what we have done... Can anyone claim that anything that they have in their life is but by the grace and the mercy of God? No. What he's saying, Brother Jordan, there are people that embrace simple ideologies. Where somebody takes one thing from the Word of God and tries to make a big deal out of it, and as a result, people cling on to that one thing and think that they're right with God as long as they have this one thing. That's not Christianity. Somebody had Christ and showed me how Christ was simple. 
No, he was all things to all people. That's not by itself. That's not nothing added to it. He was everything for all people. Everything that they would ever need. That is not a simple thing. Right? If you were to go around the room and we were to start testifying about everything that God has ever done for us in our life, it wouldn't be too long you're going to find out that God's done certain things for some people that I haven't needed in my life. You know why? Because God's not simple. He's capable of doing all things. You know what that means? He must be all things. He has power over all things. It's not limited to what I can wrap my head around. It's dependent upon what I need. That's what I get from God. Well, if I haven't needed that, that's no reason not to you know, go be jealous of that person because God gave them something that He didn't give to me. You didn't need it. It would have gone to waste. That, that's selfishness. You know what selfishness is? It's simple. Because all you got to care about is you. That's why people like it. You know why people are scoffers? Because it's simple to poke holes and make fun of things. To pick on other people. To mock things. If we wanted to start, Christian, I'll show you how to do it. We'll, make, we'll roast everybody in here. We'll make fun of you for something. But why, that's a simple way of living. It's called pessimism. Right? You can have a bleak outlook. You're not responsible for being hopeful or joyful. All you're responsible for is tearing other people down and make yourself feel better. You know what the root of that is? Selfishness. That's simple. Foolishness is simple. You know why? Because you deceive yourself into believing there's no consequences. That just means you get to do what you want to do. That's the mentality and the, the driving factor behind sin. If it feels good, do it. That's all that matters. Don't worry about what comes after and the consequences and everything you've got to deal with. Simplicity in the eyes of God is sinful. Why? Because He wants you to go out and to be a witness to the world. You know what that means? That means before you go out, you have to be faithful to add those things to your spirituality that God wants you to have before you go out. Why? Because He wants you to use what He's given you to impact other people. You can't do that with simple things. Why? Because people are complicated. How can you minister unto someone if you've never learned or never received anything from God? Can't happen. Minister means to serve, to meet the need of somebody else. Well, if all you've got is a couple of individual Lego blocks, that's not going to help people too much if their house is falling apart. It's not going to help people too much if their life's falling apart. If you want to give them an answer, well, grace is really good, and then leave... You haven't done anything for that person except lower their opinion of the things of God. Is it because God isn't God? No, it's because you were simple. You know how many times Christians have hurt people because they were simple? You know how many times that people saved on their way to heaven have lessened the opinion of God in other people's hearts and minds because they were simple in a moment. Here's the thing about simplicity. It's not a yes or a no. It's not a light switch. If you're like me, you can get into that mindset, hey, I'm in the middle of doing something, don't bother me. You can be real simple outwardly, even though you got a lot of gears turning inwardly. We're not to be simple. You know, every request or petition that you take to God, God takes it as serious as any other prayer that's ever been prayed. Why? Because He's no respecter of persons. In fact, He told you to cast all your cares upon Him because He cares for you. God wants you to do that. So He receives them all with the same level of respect. Is it any wonder that Jesus said, Don't hinder the little children? Well, they don't know what they're praying for, but it, if it's important to them, it's important to God. Right? God doesn't discriminate against the requests that are brought to Him. 
So just because you're busy or just because you had a bad day or you're stressed or you're overloaded, it doesn't give you an excuse or an escape to where you don't have to deal with something that somebody brought to you. You can give a simple answer. You know what that's going to do? It may hurt that person. We heard it on Wednesday night. We're to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. We're supposed to be sheep. Sheep aren't intimidating. I've never seen a sheep that I looked at and I thought, ooh, that thing might hurt me. Doesn't happen. Now, a ram is a different thing. It's got horns. Okay? They butt heads for fun. Eh, that's weird. I used to think that of the guys that I played football with. I'm like, why are you guys fight? Right? You're, you're both wearing pads. It's not going to get anything done. You can't hurt the other guy. What's the point? We're supposed to be blameless before others. Simple people carry a whole lot of blame around. You know why? It's because they should have known better. It should never be said of us as Christians that we should have known we should have already known. Because we have a God who has promised that if you seek it, He's going to let you find it. If you knock, it's going to be opened. Unto, if you ask, you will receive. That's what that word shall means. It means that nothing can stop it from happening. Do you know why people are simple as Christians? Because they love simplicity. You can't love simplicity and love God the way that you ought to. Because God is a very complex God. There's a lot of different pieces to God to figure out. People, well, God is love. That's one of the things that He is, but He's a whole lot more. You can't truly worship God if all you think is that God is love. He's also a God that's righteous. He's also a God that has promised vengeance upon the earth for what the earth has done to his only begotten son. He's a God that rains hellfire and brimstone down upon Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness. He's a God that draws lines in sand and you ought not cross them. You know what one of those lines in the sand is? Simplicity. Don't be simple. Being simple is a sin. We're supposed to be well-rounded Christians. We're supposed to be Christians that regardless of what the world throws at us, whatever the Lord allows Satan to throw at us, whatever our own flesh can throw at us, we're meant to rule and reign over this flesh as a king in Christ. We're supposed to be able to not necessarily handle the situation, but we're to be able to cope with it. We're to be able to cast it upon the Lord and by faith live as if nothing has changed. Because in the eyes of God, nothing has changed. You're still a child of the king. You know what the danger in simplicity is? If all you have are simple things to hold on to, it's real easy to discourage you. Because if one of your little pieces doesn't fit the hole that has sprung a leak in your boat, then you think that you don't have the answer. You've got a whole book of answers. The reason that you're discouraged is not because the answer's not in here. It's because the answer didn't make it from there to here. Simple people are really easy to deceive. Because all you have to do is use the right buzzwords and they think that you believe like they believe. And they can be deceived into a lie. Why? Because they didn't have roots deep enough to know what was right and what was wrong. Those are the people that, well, they're going to church somewhere. Somewhere's not good enough. I want them somewhere where they're going to hear the truth. As long as truth's being preached, I don't have a problem with it. But if there's not preaching, it's not church. If there isn't what thus saith the Lord, but if there isn't instruction, if there's not, I'm not saying all of it's got to be rebuke. I'm saying instruction. Right? Edification. That's building people up. That's our job, not to tear people down. You think your house was simple to build? It's pretty simple to put a nail through a two-by-four, but it's not too simple to put a whole bunch of two-by-fours and concrete and brick and mortar and everything else on the outside 
so that it's a house. It may have been done with simple techniques, but that doesn't mean that the finished product is simple. Right? If houses were simple, people wouldn't want to live in them. You know what's simple? A lean-to. People don't want to live in lean-tos. They want to live in houses. A house is something that's simple to define. You know what's not simple to define? A home. There are a lot of simple things that go into making a house a home, but that's a complex thing. Easy to be discouraged, easy to be deceived, but they're also easy to be defeated. If you convince somebody that the four or five pieces that they have aren't strong enough to win, and they may not be on their own, but if you were to put on the whole armor of God, you know what that means? The helmet of salvation is not enough for you to win on its own. Breastplate of righteousness on its own isn't going to keep you in the fight. You've got to have the whole armor, and then it says, and taking unto you the shield of faith, and the word, the sword. You need all of it. Those are simple things on their own, but when put together, it gives you a complex defense against the devil. But if you've only got a few things, and that's all that in your mind and in your heart your spirituality consists of, it's real easy for you to get defeated. Not because God didn't give you the tools, but because you loved the simple things that didn't require dedication, didn't... Didn't require devotion. Didn't require you yielding yourself to become what God wants you to be. Because you know what God wants to make you into? A masterpiece. One day He will. It'll be completed when we get to glory. But as we said, a masterpiece is not something simple. It's a lot of simple things that turn into something beautiful, something that brings glory and honor unto God. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.